Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Stefan. Uh, really excited to have you here. Uh, we initially met uh, in Breakpoint, um, and it was awesome to meet you and your team. Uh, and overall, just super excited what you're building at Squads. Um, excited for kind of the partnership that we're uh, building out. Uh, but no, uh, just excited to have you and talk more about uh, what you're building, because I think especially now at kind of this point in time, uh, self-custody is more important now than ever. Um, and so I think to start off the podcast, I always try to kind of start from the beginning um, and would love to kind of just hear how you got involved in tech. Um, and then ultimately from there, how you got involved into uh, crypto and blockchain. Sure. And yeah, thanks for, for having me. I'm, I'm excited for our partnership. I'm excited, excited to chat with you uh, and kind of dive in um into all things squads and, and what's happening i think it's the right right time to do this as well um yeah, so my story is pretty pretty strange like I, I haven't met too many people that did the transition from um big law into tech and then um crypto um we just had this legal dinner in lisbon with different lawyers from from different teams uh so there i i, I met a bunch of people that, that do that as well did that as well but um yeah, I think it's an interesting story from a perspective that like I never did. I, I, I'm not a developer. I never did any coding, but I did corporate M&A for about five years before doing this. Um, I worked with some startups helping out, helping them out from like a legal side of things. But um, that's that was like maximum of my exposure to tech at the time. And um, the first time I think I got into crypto, at least like in, in some capacity, was around 2017. I was at Clifford Chance, one of the sort of larger UK law firms and um, the the sort of Bitcoin was booming and clients started asking, um, how do we invest? What's blockchain? Like what are potential you know, legal repercussions of doing that? And yeah, I mean, I did some research for them at the time and like learned some things myself. And so that was like the initial exposure, I guess. And then there were a few years, like a gap in between. And then around 2020, I started looking um, specifically at the governance space um on eth at the time and sort of the idea there was it was pretty clear to me how DeFi could disrupt finance and i was curious to see how um sort of the governance tooling um the governance tooling space could disrupt what i was dealing with and by then i already left sort of the larger firms and i had my own smaller uh private practice i was dealing with sort of high to mid net worth individuals helping them structure asset ownership and do transactions and things like this and um definitely there was tons of inefficiencies. And so I turned to to blockchain just to see maybe there is like a solution out there that actually makes it better. And um, yeah, so started looking into governance tools early 2020 and then spent a year doing that. And um, yeah, early 2021, um, kind of decided to transition to, to actually building things and, and started thinking about what could that be and um, learned about Solana and um, yeah, a couple of months stuck around the Discord and then the hackathon started and we kind of took off from there. That's amazing. That's that's wild. Uh, ultimately, being in law uh, and kind of transitioning into tech and then ultimately building a tech company, that's a big jump. Uh, have you found that there's been like any uh, parallels from like the legal side of things to uh, building a company? I mean, um, I think... So I like to preface this by saying, I actually really don't like um, consulting in general. And so <laughs> yeah. I think like that, um, I was thinking a lot about like doing something else, right? So definitely having experience doing consulting helped in running a company because you kind of, you know, the, the feeling of being in the arena and actually like going out of this is a lot more fun, a lot more stressful in some yeah. ways, but a lot more fun. And um yeah, so I think like there are some parallels. There, there are more parallels with me running my private practice that I did um, for a few years as well. That that seemed more familiar, and I, it was already kind of decentralized for me. I had you know kind of employees in different places, and um, it, it was I was kind of getting into it, I guess. But it, it's still you know there's a there's a learning curve, and um, a lot of the a lot of the experiences I had in the last uh, year and a half have been for sure first time experiences, but. Um, I think one thing that helped a lot is like in law, you're, you have to be very meticulous with details. Like you need to review a lot of documents and, 
um, kind of make sure that everything is just so and like things are not missed. Um, that is like helping me throughout, like whatever we do, whether it's the operational side of things, whether you know it's content, uh, it's product, like it's relevant everywhere. So for sure, I, I'm I'm glad that I spent a couple of years staying, you know, in the office till five a.m. Uh, reading yeah. documents, and <laughs> that's been helpful. Yeah, a, a lot of the people that I've met have kind of either been through through the fire in some sense uh my co-founder ultimately did uh investment banking and i you, whether it's legal or tech or uh um inv and investment banking whatever it may be you have to kind of put in your ten thousand hours to uh get uh those reps under your belt and so uh super super cool that you came at it from the law background what in 2020 ultimately um inspired you again to uh, come back into the crypto space? Uh, was there anything in particular that kind of caught your eye um, and what drew you back in? It was actually more external. It was more like, I really want to learn what's going on there because I haven't heard in a while um, yeah. anything about it. And um, specifically think, I think, yeah, there was something around um, DAOs. I'm not sure what it was. Maybe it was like a, YouTube video from A16Z crypto startup school or something where they would talk about the like, benefits of DAOs and yep. um, yeah, so, something like that. And I think um, that kind of made me go go back in and take a look. Um, and at the time it was just like, you know, Aragon, Compound Governor Bravo, some of the like earlier tools like Colony. Um, so a lot has changed since then. And uh, I'm glad I kind of got back into it around 2020 to actually see kind of transition from all-in-one governance tooling to modular. And that in many ways also helped to shape what we ended up building with squads moving forward. Definitely. So maybe to jump into uh, squads, could you kind of share the squad's vision, uh, ultimately why you decided to uh, build the protocol? Sure. I mean, we, we did a lot of, like we navigated the idea maze, I think pretty well. Um, yeah. in the last year and a half, but there's been a lot of navigation and, and turns and things. Um, uh, I think like the very original idea for, um, for squads at the time was around this kind of, I think for the hackathon, it was even like mobile first. And we were trying to just make, you know, group chat with a bank account, sort of like telegram with a multi-sig. That was like the, the, the like very original idea. And, and where uh, was that realized... first hackathon that you're at? That was Solana season hackathon that they did in May, 2021. I mean, it was online, like it wasn't okay. in person, uh, but that's where I met Sean, my co-founder and, um, Danny, I knew from back in the day we were world friends. And so all three of us kind of came together there and, um, it, we kind of realized that. So that was like the very original idea, group chat with a bank account. And then we started moving towards, okay, well, it needs to be obviously desktop first. And then as we were kind of going along, we realized like we were going kind of lower and lower in terms of layers of infrastructure and realizing mm -hmm. that Solana is so new that kind of by Christmas, 2021, we were like, okay, we have to build the core infra because it doesn't yes. really exist. And for us to actually realize the product vision that we had very much back in the day, like we actually need to, if we do want to do that in the end, like we need to build all the layers before. And so we started like in the ecosystem at the time, didn't really have a multi-six standard it could rely on, or like a smart contract, smart contract wallet standard. And so we started building that and there was still like the, the vision for squads today is that it's, it's a very agnostic multi-signature infrastructure layer for Solana. Multi-signature also something we are potentially going to make even broader by starting to refer to smart contract wallet infrastructure. I like that. Just because kind of it, <laughs> It, it can be a multi-sig, it can be other things. And so mm -hmm. just because of how agnostic it is. And I always say that, you know, in all the interviews and on Twitter that it's agnostic. What I mean by that is that you can really do, like, it's very programmable. You can really do anything um, with it and, and kind of tailor it towards the needs of your, you know, your team, your users who are using it for your product. And so um, the way we think about squads is that like, there's the protocol layer, which is this, you know, basically piece of code that's, secure, reliable, um, very modular, has like a lot of functionality that you can kind of shape towards your needs. And then there's the product layer, which is a UI, a very dedicated product experience that we're delivering to the Solana ecosystem that it needs today. 
and it's primarily focused on teams and builders doing things in Solana. And so a lot of it is about managing core on-chain assets, like treasury programs, tokens, workflows, validators. Um, so th the idea behind it is that like you're a project that's starting to build something on Solana, you can rely on squads as your core infra to manage different assets as they sort of come and go to you as a team, as a project throughout the lifetime of your existence. So you join a hackathon, you know, you get a grant, you put it in the multi-sig, you launch a mainnet, you transfer that with authority to the squad. You decide to mint your token and start vesting it. You mint it directly from the squad and then through integrations, you can vest it to investors, employees, and whoever you want to vest it to. And then as you kind of decide, okay, we're ready to decentralize, you can spin up a governance instance um, on Realms, for instance, and, and start transferring those assets to the community. Um, and then you can rely on squads to actually utilize it as a sub DAO framework for your DAO as you kind of progress. So we really try to be there for all parts of the life cycle um, of a project. And so far, so far, so good. That's awesome. Uh, a lot, a lot in there. Let's start. Ultimately, I always find it fascinating. I think today, one of the hard parts of blockchains more broadly is that there's so many different blockchains. There's Ethereum, which I think a lot of us ultimately got started with, uh, ultimately Solana came in. Uh, now there's, um, AVAX, uh, SWE, Aptos, uh, a bunch. Um, and so ultimately, how, how did you and your team decide to um, choose uh, the Solana ecosystem to build the squad's product? Right. That's a great question. Um, I've been actually thinking about this uh, for a few for weeks now, trying to remember how it all happened. And I think like, um, to be honest, it was really organic. Like I was in a position where I wanted to realize a certain vision. I had kind of a lot of business background, legal background, but non-technical. And my approach was to kind of get, get, you know, get out there and talk to as many people as possible about the ideas I have about kind of the vision that I have. And I joined a bunch of discords. I joined, um, some of like Ethereum developer related discords, stacks discord. That's the Bitcoin, uh, I think layer, smart contract layer. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, a bunch of others and Solana. Um, Solana as well, and it just seemed really vibrant. Like there were so many developers that wanted to do stuff and wanted to build things. And so it seemed like, you know, sharing, exchanging ideas and concepts w w was like the friendliest, the friendliest space for that was Solana Discord at the time. And so that's what led us, uh, kind of to meet Sean, to meet Bastion, our core developer that it has been with us since. And so that, that all really happened organically. And so, you know, kind of one thing led to the other and we realized, oh, we're, we're actually building this on Solana and that's happening. And then, you know, then one thing led to the other, like, oh, we're actually raising, you know, the first round and we're going full time. So all of it kind of really, um, happened naturally. We yep. wasn't like meticulous planning that got us there. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, no, it's, it's been interesting. I, I've been talking with a lot of different founders and I'm always curious cause there's, there's a lot of different options now today. Uh, and I think now more than ever, it's still extremely important to, uh, essentially choose the correct one. And it's not always easy or, uh, obvious in the beginning. And so, uh, ultimately I'm, I'm super excited that you, you and the team, the squad team are building on Solana. Uh, obviously very large fans of the Solana ecosystem. And so, uh, excited for, uh, you and, uh, the squad team and Solana to kind of grow together. Um, but out that, uh, another thing that you said that caught my eye, was ultimately, uh, the ability or instead of just describing, um, squads as a multi-sig kind of more as a smart contract wallet. Could you dive into, uh, why, uh, you kind of want to reframe it and some of the new like possibilities that you're building, uh, within the squads ecosystem? I think the, that's a great question. I think like the, um, the whole rebranding or, you know, adjustment of messaging comes from us learning more about the infrastructure we are building ourselves and yeah. about the users that come along and um, kind of broaden the use cases for us. Like originally multi-sigs have been thought of as wallets because they were there to hold your treasury assets. And that was that. And so we would refer to it as a multi-sig wallet. 
then we started exploring you know, managing program upgrades, managing validators, managing tokens, a lot more things. And so we started saying, well, maybe it's, it's more of a consensus mechanism than it is a wallet. Cause you know, once you get into program stuff, that's not really, um, it's not really treasury. And so yep. then we were, for a while, we were calling it internally, like a consensus mechanism on a sort of team, team level. And then now as we're like everything that, that happened the last few, few weeks kind of um, reinvigorated the discussion around self-custody and uh, making self-custody easier for kind of retail users and um, those that are not in Web3 yet. And so I think smart contract wallets is just even a kind of broader way to describe it where it's not necessarily about um, kind of managing things together or about managing even like these kind of core assets. It can be about just, you can, you can utilize the same infrastructure to you know, create individual wallets that, for instance, don't have seed phrases, have social recovery. And so that kind of goes into the account abstraction territory. And because basically a multi-sig um, is already an example of account abstraction where you kind of separate, yep. you know, it's like the signer key and then there's the, the contract itself that holds the assets. Um, and so we're kind of thinking that direction a bit more and trying to understand um, yeah, what's the, how, how can we kind of position the infrastructure that we have? So it's kind of welcoming towards building these kind of things on top of it as well. Uh, I love that. I, I think, I mean, ultimately, uh, kind of the ownership over private key management, I would still say is one of the hardest issues. And I'd say even highlighted by kind of FTX with, and I mean, people more broadly, just kind of holding crypto assets on exchanges. Um, and I would say either being afraid or not understanding the private key management and being afraid to kind of move their exchange, their assets off the exchange or um, just like I, either that or there's just not enticing applications yet for them to like learn and kind of get over the hurdle. But I'm, I'm super excited ultimately uh, that squads is kind of reframing the problem in some sense to, uh, address kind of a bigger issue in the space. Uh, and also the social recovery. Uh, I've always found that fascinating about like wallets, because, uh, if you ask the normal person to write down a 12 or 24 seed phrase word and be like, all right, this is your piece of paper. Don't lose it. If you lose it, you're screwed. And so, um, the social recovery makes a lot more sense in my eyes as well. Yeah, I think like two two things that come to mind um, on, on on all of this. Like one is that um, I don't think that like I've been talking to a bunch of uh, people that have worked in like very large Web two startups that grown, and I was just really curious about their OPSEC practices. Like you, yep. they obviously don't use a multi sec for things. How do you like manage uh, your core, you know, like network architecture, infrastructure, and this kind of thing? And so the answer is that always it's tied to a person. And so there would be like a security company that verifies that, you know, this person is, is actually uh, the right one and they would get like some kind of key access or token that allows them to manage it. Um, I don't think that's like a perfect system. And it's, it's, I think it makes sense to me that it's hard to rethink it. Right. And we have yep. cryptography, we have um, all this new infrastructure. That's great. And so it's fine that it takes time and kind of trial and error. I think the second point is that today it's kind of binary. It's either, you use self custody or you, you rely on centralized custodians. I think what we will see in the, um, like the next few years as it develops is that it's going to become a kind of spectrum that you can navigate with your wallet in the sense that, um, you know, you will opt in to give certain level of control over your, um, assets or over your kind of wallet in general to a certain mm -hmm. provider that you want to service from, you know, you want fiat on off ramp. So you give a certain level of control to them. Right. And you want to be able to have overdraft, like borrow things to then purchase them uh, right away. That's like another layer of this. You want um, the DAP that you're interacting with to be able to recover your assets. So you need to give them some level of control as well. And you can kind of go along uh, throughout your web three journey, interacting with these things, kind of picking and choosing, and then you can obviously kind of reclaim it back. And I think that's where programmability of smart contract wallets and the nature of account abstraction really yeah. make it possible. And so I think that's very early. We're not really um, exploring that too far along yet, just because like we definitely tried to do like an iterative approach because Solana is still 
pretty early, even in terms of like general multi-sig adoption. So that's like the, the primary objective. But mm -hmm. thinking ahead, this is definitely something where and there's a bunch of projects already um, on Solana that are looking into building in that space and thinking about the kind of traction and better UX for wallets. And we're, you know, in touch with them in terms of us helping them out with our infrastructure and, and utilizing it um, for different kinds of products. Yeah, different levels of permissions for different types of assets or even different types of applications totally makes sense. Um, and it's, it is funny, like you mentioned, like a lot of these things, even, I mean, Solana, but more broadly, just the crypto ecosystem, uh, the amount of users just using these applications is so little. I think sometimes we forget how early we actually are. Uh, and even some of these basic things that you're like, oh, yeah, that obviously should be the case um do not exist yet and so i'm glad uh that you and the squad team are thinking about it because ultimately to onboard a billion people uh these are definitely the type of things that and products that need to be built to get to that point um so maybe kind of continuing on just some of the products that you and the squad team are building you mentioned treasury uh like program management um, even like workflow management, could you kind of break apart those three and kind of the goal or vision, uh, that you're, um, with each of those like core products? Right. So they all like make, they, they all make, um, come together basically in the, in the product experience that we deliver today. Um, I think like treasure management is pretty basic, um, in, in terms of what teams rely on today, because majority of treasuries are kind of VC raised or, you know, grant funds. So there isn't that much to manage. There's usually, you know, they want to safely store them and then, you know, do payroll or pay costs for things. Mm -hmm. So that's like in treasure management side, it's, um, it's more about providing them with a core multi-sig infrastructure that they can trust and rely on to hold their assets, as opposed to doing that with centralized custodians and banks. Um, and so treasure management is pretty basic today, but we expect it to get more complicated, um, uh, potentially as kind of more complicated payroll gets on chain, as well as just, um, I think teams today, they still kind of diversify in terms of where they hold their treasuries. So some of mm -hmm. it is, you know, still in banks, some of it is maybe on Ethereum, some of it on Solana. It's, it's kind of more of those treasuries get on Solana and it, it can get more interesting on that front. I think in terms of programs, that's definitely the killer use case today because with treasuries, they have a choice. And with programs, they don't like it needs to be yeah. on somewhere and so on. And so uh, the options are have a single key that manages it. That's a single point of failure and program upgrades to, to give you context is, is basically, um, that kind of key that allows you to completely, you know, change the whole program, however you, you might want to. And so the stakes are high. If it's a program that's, you know, contains a lot of TVL, it needs to be stored securely and the flow that we provide in the product is kind of centered around the idea that even if you like trust your teammates, you still would want more visibility into that process and you would want yep. control of that very, you know, maybe the most important asset that you have, um, to be decentralized, to be under control of multiple keys, even from like security perspective. So there like, aren't any accidents, but also that because it's kind of a joint decision to upgrade our main program. Right. And so I think, um, because the majority of Solana programs are uh, upgradable, so they're not immutable. Um, there's like a whole other discussion that um, is happening right now and that we're, we're having that internally as well. But I think generally um, program management is essential. And we have seen in the last few weeks kind of another wave of protocols transitioning to using squads for this. And I mean, for us, it's, um, it's a the most complicated job that we were trying to, to do, particularly with V3, the, the, the most recent version was around kind of selling the standard, like convincing the ecosystem and doing everything right, that this is the, you know, this is the piece of code you can trust with your program or with your mm -hmm. treasury. And so we're still very much iterating on it, but we had a very clear roadmap on what we wanted to do on the security side, on the architectural side that we're performing. And um, I think the first chapter of this should be complete by by end of the year. So it's nice. kind of a new year present for me. We'll we can touch <laughs> on that later. But yeah, I think that's um, that's how we're seeing it. And then workflow management is just this very um, abstract term. Um, so basically, there are certain um, workflows that your team 
might want to manage through a multisig when it comes to managing your own protocol. For instance, if you're an Oracle and you need to approve uh, new publishers and new price feeds, uh, you might, might want to kind of do that together, you know, or have like a dedicated part of the team that's responsible for this. And so they would jointly approve it as opposed to just doing that individually. So that's just like one example. And to facilitate that, we have the transaction builder that um, basically allows you to create custom transactions and populate them with arbitrary instructions. So you can really interact with any program on Solana with your multi-sig. And so it really is a playground for developers to create these things. And then sometimes they reach out uh, and ask us to create certain templates to make it easier to interact with a specific program and do certain things. So we do that as well. Uh, we have a bunch of templates there. Right now we did a few of them for like Jito guys to manage their stake pool program and, and other things as well. So that's been also one of the interesting uh, streams for us, for sure. Nice. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, even just recently, again, kind of with the FTX fallout with Serum, uh, we, we saw kind of the community come together fork uh serum uh because that contract upgrade key i believe was a individual instead of kind of the company or even people outside of the company being able to upgrade that contract so uh again squads would have come in and uh be able to uh provide a much better solution ultimately having multiple people uh at least um kind of ultimately being able to sign and then uh, a couple extra steps of uh, oversight there instead of one individual. Absolutely. And, and it's not just like security. Sometimes it's UX. For instance, we're mm -hmm. uh, working right now on the integration with um, WordCell, where, for instance, with WordCell, the idea that right now you link your WordCell account to an individual key. And so if you need to, if you want to transfer it to somebody else, you need to like give them control of the wallet. Mm -hmm. And if that was a multi-sig, it could be like, you know, multi-sig with three signers, one out of three threshold. So always one key would be able to post things, but you never need to, like, if you want to transfer the account to somebody, you just swap them out in a multi-sig as opposed to like transferring the wallet to somebody. So it's not just about security, potential UX yeah, enhancements and things like this, definitely relevant as well. Interesting. There's a lot of that cool things uh, that you guys are working on. I would say what, out from like the product perspective and user experience, what do you feel like is going to be some of the larger or biggest challenges that you've seen today for people just to adopt some of like the multi-sig standards or to either create uh, uh, easier to use products for just people in crypto more broadly? Yeah, I think like there's, it really depends on the type of the user. I think like these kind of more advanced teams that use, you know, program management features and more complex things, um, for them, the, um, you know, th they have different problems basically than just like a regular retail user. I think mm -hmm. the, um, the problems we're trying to solve today are very much around like balancing, um, security and, uh, kind of and features because a lot of the features that we want to introduce, like for instance, dynamic thresholds for different types of transactions, that's a great UX improvement and many teams want it. At the same time, we want the core multi-sig program to be very minimal, very rigid, so that it's like 600 lines of code, really easy to review, really easy to formally verify, and, and it's, uh, that's it, right? So for some teams, there's a certain level of comfort knowing that it's a very simple program. So mm -hmm. worst case, they can review it themselves. And so that's like the hardest balancing act when it comes to like solving for UX as opposed to keeping it. And so the, the solution that we came up with, the only thing we came up with is that it's like continuous iteration, but with cutoff, cutoff dates. So for instance, we already know in our heads where V3 will be when we formally verify it and freeze it and which features it will support. And we're already working on V4, which will be a separate nice. program, which will have sort of a larger uh, code base and will have more features. And so we can like, you know, we built it up to a place, we cut it off. So like when we're certain that it's, complete and done and secure and formally verified. And we move on to the next one. And like, maybe it will never end. Maybe after a couple of versions, it will be complete. And um, we're also trying to solve that by doing a mod modular architecture where there's a lot of companion programs around the main squads program. So um, we're never contributing to the main code base, but actually building different modules around 
So we don't need to touch the core malicious logic. And so we try not to touch it at all. Um, again, for like the purpose of security. And um, yeah, so that's like more on the more, more like advanced user side, for sure. Uh, on the topic of security, I, I think that's kind of the um, other kind of hurdle people in their minds probably have to get over. Um, with uh feeling comfortable with uh holding their assets uh on these um programs or or using multi-sig and trusting the multi-sig uh i know you and the ottersec team ultimately gave a presentation at um uh breakpoint uh on formal verification uh on a high level could you kind of just touch upon like some of the aspects of that formal verification and how they contribute to security for sure. I mean, it's been like um, a huge focus for us the last few months. And um, the reason formal verification came about is we kind of were thinking, okay, what, what's this final frontier for making sure that squad's code base is as secure as it can be? And like we did a bunch of audits and other sec as our ongoing security partners or whatever, every companion program, everything we, we send their way to, to check. But formal verification is this um, basically higher level of audit where you kind of break down the code into math and you sort of prove that certain things are possible and certain things are not possible in the code mm -hmm. base. That's how I understand it with my legal non, non developer mind. And so, um, really it's Robert doing all the work and the Autosec team. And, um, we are just, um, in constant sort of contact with them, trying to make it easier for them because we obviously also iterate on the program and, um, the, the reason it's a complicated task for everybody involved is because they're like Solana is pretty new. And so there isn't really a framework, um, for specifically for verifying Solana programs. There are frameworks for Rust, like Kanye and Prusty that allow to do that, but nobody has like meaningfully did a kind of deep dive and actually formally verify the Solana program. So we're kind of hoping that squads will open floodgates for this as well. Um, bear in mind that like, again, the reason it's possible is because squads is very small. It's, it's very minimal program. So mm -hmm. there aren't that many things that you need to form a verify. If it's like, you know, a few thousand, thousand lines of plans of code and there's a lot of complicated logic, um, it just, it's possible as well, but it will take very long. Like it, it's even for us, it's taken a while, uh, a few months, right, to, to get it done. Um, and so for us, after, after it's formally verified, we will make it immutable. And so with that um, statement we want to do, we, we want to try and lead the way um, in, in the, in the ecosystem in the sense that, you know, trying to convey that those two things are actually very important for pretty much any program to get from verified and eventually become, uh, immutable. Um, and so that's like very important for us to, and that, that's why we did a presentation at breakpoint because we think it's essential and we don't want to encourage more projects to think about immutability as well as think about at least from verifying parts, uh, of their code base. Um, and yeah, and so Robert is, uh, having a bunch of sleepless nights and, <laughs> and days and weeks, uh, getting it done. But yeah, that's, that's my new year present. I'm like, I'm, I'm hoping for. That's awesome. Uh, no, I'm, uh, been talking with Robert, uh, quite a bit and, uh, definitely, uh, plan to get him on the podcast as well and do a deep dive on the formal verification. Uh, but no, I, I think, uh, how you're approaching it, uh, being able to mathematically approve or uh, essentially state that uh, this is secure, um, ultimately uh, modularizing uh, the code base uh, so you can ossify uh, kind of the specific uh, contracts so you know those don't change, and then kind of allowing other applications to integrate with it. Um, uh, it is super fascinating. Uh, can you talk about, so uh, uh, you talked about kind of the workflow, treasury management, uh, program management, uh, but you have a, a couple other projects that are kind of under the squad's umbrella with like the squad's command line interface. Um, and I don't know if you have talked about it at all, but squad's X, um, could you touch upon both of those as well? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, yeah, so the CLI interface, the CLI, um, package that we have is just this very simple command line interface for squads for like the very pro users. Um, mm -hmm. we actually shipped it during breakpoint together with, um, uh, an immutable version of the program. We called it the based multi-sig. It has its own nice kind of cyberpunkish landing page. And, <laughs> nice. um, it's really for those, for those users that like, you know, is, 
is quite upgradable. We're like, well, the current version still is, but if you care about this sort of thing, here's the non-upgradable version as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't have a UI, but it has a CLI because we feel like if you care enough about it, you can, you know, you, you should navigate the CLI. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the Squads X is, we haven't actually announced it yet. It's kind of in, in private beta uh, right now. We're testing it internally. And um, the short of it is that it's, um, I, I don't want to comment too much on this okay. detail yet, <laughs> just because it's, it's kind of, but I can tell you that like, it's, um, it's, a, it's a UX improvement um, additional tool that improves the UX of how you uh, interact with your multi sig with other protocols on Solana. And the core idea behind it is that like, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you, um, the user of our smart contract wallet to be able to kind of do anything that you you can do with Phantom or with Glow or with Backpack um, to be able to do that um, uh, with your multi sig. So I think that's like where we can uh, kind of seal it off for now, but uh, nice. we'll, uh, we'll also uh, announce things. Yeah. Cool. No, uh, super excited for everything ultimately that uh, the squads team is doing. Uh, one thing I would love to continue to dive deeper into is on like the application front. Uh, so you've announced kind of multiple partnerships as of recently or uh, applications also integrating with um, squads. Could you talk about uh, how that works? Um, and kind of, again, like some of the goals uh, or vision that uh, you're trying to achieve with those partnerships. Right, so th those partnerships are usually, like there's multiple um, kind of inspirations for them. I think one is, the main one is that with V3 specifically, we we try to be as user-driven as possible, as much as, user, as, much as possible uh, for, for this, for sure. And um, the way it works is that we have SCS that's like a, collective of teams that uh, use squads and help us kind of refine it and move the product forward. Um, and so a lot of the integrations and features that you see um, are driven by them. Like they would ask us for a specific feature and if there's like enough interest across the board, we would uh, implement it. Um, the other part is kind of business development. For instance, there would be, you know, a very large project that would say, um, we want to use your multisig for treasure management for program upgrades. But we obviously want to, for instance, manage our treasury through our own protocol. And so that also calls for an integration if you feel like that's important enough for, you know, to get them on board. So those are like probably two main ones. Um, the way it kind of works is interesting is because um, with V2, everything that every integration that we've done was kind of hard coded in. And so it took mm -hmm. a while and involved the kind of alteration of the on-chain code with uh, V3. Again, it being agnostic, which is great, everything is just an arbitrary instruction from the on-chain level perspective. And so every integration that we do is just a different UI front-end wrapper on top of an arbitrary instruction. And so in that sense, we really just do front-end work when we talk about doing an integration, uh, which is a huge relief, right? And again, it contributes to security of, of things that are happening. Um, some of the like highlights, um, so we've got a lot of staking integrations. We've done the um, Gito liquid staking. We integrated the um, StakeWiz um, platform that Lane uh, the validator operates. And so you can really stake mm -hmm. with any Solana validator directly from your multisig. We did the Dead God staking as well. So that, that was just like requested a lot because people wanted yeah. to hold their Dead Gods on the multisig. At the same time, we wanted to stake them, right? And so we had to uh, accommodate and um, the Dust Lab, Labs guys have been super helpful in, in getting it across the board. Um, we also have the Magic Eden integration that allows you to uh, buy NFTs directly with your multi-sig. And uh, we're about to ship like the, um, the sell feature as well, as well as the auction and, and things like this. Um, yeah, and then there's like apps. So we did Soland, we did uh, Psy Options and Friction. So you can diversify a treasury directly from the multi-sig. And those are like iframe apps. So they basically have a little in-app browser uh, within Squad that allows you to kind of interact with their interfaces. Um, and when you connect and when you open it, it, it shows that the Squad is like the connected wallet instead of a traditional wallet. Um, and then there's like smaller integrations that we did um, on the NFT side with Cardinal uh, for rentals, for instance. So like if you have, if you you know hold NFTs in the multi-sig, but you still want to 
do you know pass Discord gates, do do the community things that uh, utility yep. of that NFT brings. So you can rent it out via Cardinal from your multi-sig vault to your hot wallet, and then do things that you want to do. Um, yeah, and then there's obviously dialect integration that allows you to get notified on multi-sig transactions. I think that's like the most amazing thing is when we talk to people from other ecosystems, specifically like Ethereum, that's that thing gets them like going. That that thing gets them amazed. That oh, you can get like a you know Telegram message or an email or a text message that you need to sign this multi-sig transaction. That that seems to be the the killer use case uh, for for them. And uh, yeah, a lot of teams rely on dialect for sure. And it why? I sense. mean. Yeah, on like Ethereum per se. I I used to be more of an ETH maxi at one point in time, but I've I've just learned a lot about the tech to kind of continue to remain a T ETH maxi. But why why are some of these things like in your point of view just much harder on the Ethereum ecosystem to build? Um, or like why did you not build squads on Ethereum versus uh, trying building it ultimately on Solana? Um, I think like. If we were to make a decision, like if there was a point where we had to like, you know, which ecosystem we go to build things in, um, I think like Ethereum has a very reliable smart contract wallet standard that's been around for a while. And that's mm -hmm. very much, you know, trusted and, and Lindy by now. And, and I think the safe team is great. And, um, you know, if today I had to make the choice, I, today I realized that I really like building infrastructure. I like. Uh, building the whole stack as opposed to parts of it, mm -hmm. um, at least at, at the outset. And so on Ethereum, we would probably, if we would want to, to do something like this, we would actually go into the, just the product layer, right? And build it on top of safe, which is also very interesting. But if I have an opportunity to, you know, own the stack and, and kind of focus on, on all parts of it, um, that potentially is, 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 is more fun for us to focus on today. And yep. then Solana itself, though, kind of allows us to bring, like, for instance, a lot of the things that you do with your safe on uh, Ethereum, you either rely on the Gnosis chain that they have, or there's like, I think aspects of it are off chain completely. I think on Solana, um, it allows us to have everything on chain and it doesn't compromise any UX. And potentially it, it is easier for, you know, from the kind of integration perspective for certain things. It basically, you know, having everything on chain from many perspectives makes it a better UX for us in terms of like doing integrations and iterating on the protocol, as well as for users and like partners that integrate with us. Um, yeah, I, I think like, um, I'm not, I, I've never been on Ethereum Maxi, but I think a lot of the um, things that are happening there are very interesting. And I think um, at the end, in the end, it will kind of, there will be a way that two ecosystems complement each other more than uh, like what's happening today. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, so definitely today we're very much focused on Solana and um, we think there's like, it's, you know, there's a clear problem. There's a clear user that yeah. wants to have a, that needs a specific piece of infra and we're excited to be bringing it um, right here and now. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I remember ultimately trying to set up like a Genesis multi-sig on Solana during the bull market, but the ETH gas fees were just so high. I think it was like 500 or or $1,000 ultimately to like set up this multi-sig on Ethereum. And one thing that I initially like captured my eye about Solana is just like how cheap everything was. I mean, fractions of a penny. Uh, how much ultimately on average does it cost to set up uh, a squad's multi-sig on uh, Solana? It's, um, I, I mean, it, it, it's flexible depending on the size. Um, yeah. But if it's like up to 15 uh, members, I think you'll land at around 0 0.045, <laughs> yeah. something like that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's pretty cheap. To be fair, today, deploying a safe on ETH is on Ethereum mainnet is is also not, not not a huge fee, but at the time it was prohibitive for for me as well. I think like I think when it comes to things like safe, um, if you're deploying a multi sig, you probably like have a pretty good reason to, and mm -hmm. you know you want to give you know have certain security for for certain assets. Um, I think the, the where Ethereum is a bit more prohibitive is when you like want to play around with things, right? If you want to yep. just if you're very new and you want to test. Um, you know, you want to do 
you know, play around with Uniswap or um, do things with lending protocols. I think that's where Solana initially had a huge advantage um, for all of users and for, for me as well, even to like test those like core DeFi primitives and understand how they work and get excited about them. Like it's easier when the pricing of the install is not prohibitive for sure. For sure. No, I mean, ultimately I, and that's why I think I got frustrated with like the blockchain ecosystem and started like scudding the different scaling solutions so heavily because, because I think the technology is so cool and ultimately you're not going to be able, you're, you're not, you're not, you're never an expert from the beginning. You have to, uh, play around with things. You have to test things. You have to sign with a private key. You have to set up the multi-sig. You have to use dApps. And if it's so expensive that it, that's just like prohibitive, it kind of made me sad. And that's why I was so, uh, excited ultimately when I dug deeper into the Sano ecosystem and I was like, oh, this is like actually a legitimate alternative and, uh, that like will actually scale. Um, and so. It's been fun kind of following along with the ecosystem, but uh, it's definitely been uh, challenging as of recently. Has any of like the recent events, say with like FTX, um, change your point of view on Solana or the Solana ecosystem? Because I think now a lot of, at least in the news or the clickbait articles, um, it says like everybody's leaving Solana, it's going to zero. Um, so curious to get your thoughts around um, yeah, the state of the Solana ecosystem. Yeah, I think like, um, I think for us, nothing has changed. Like, uh, the, the only thing that changed is like more people realize that, um, uh, they need to rely on self custody tools and that they need ones with good UX. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's a lot of, a lot of concerns on Twitter and, and different articles around like what's going to happen to Solana. Um, I'm not worried, nor is the squad's team, nor any of our partners or investors, like everybody's kind of really doubling down and kind of sincerely believing that what happened with FTX is at worst net neutral for the ecosystem and very likely net positive. Um, and, um, I think in general, like it only highlighted the strengths of the ecosystem and the timing of it luckily was right after breakpoint, at least where, um, we all got to get together and, um, talk to each other and meet each other and learn about what everybody's building and get actually really excited about the ecosystem at large, like with every, you know, everything that Anatoly and, um, you know, the jump guys with fire dancer have mentioned what's happening on the kind of the, the very, uh, foundational layer of Solana, as well as all the like new projects and, and dApps that are coming on board as well. So I think there's a lot of things to be excited about. Um, the ecosystem today feels very much connected and people like help each other out. And like the open book example is great, right? Like a bunch of protocols that potentially can be competitors came together to, you know, rebuild this foundational piece of infrastructure that they all need, um, to, to operate. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, the fundamentals around Solana haven't changed. And, um, if only the recent events, just like highlighted why we're all here, why we're all kind of chose Solana. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're definitely, um, excited to see what's happening, um, in the coming sort of weeks and months. And to be honest, like I get a lot of, um, while I read all these news, I also get people reaching out, um, to me directly or, um, kind of asking basically advice about the ecosystem, thinking that they want to get more involved and there's like potentially larger players that are exploring coming in from kind of what kind of from my perspective. So I think definitely there's a lot of reasons. There are a lot of reasons to, to be excited about Solana. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's, it was interesting. I mean, I think, were you at breakpoint last year? No, I actually wasn't. My no. co-founder was, Daniel was. Yeah. Okay. Breakpoint last year was funny. Uh, after personally, after reading a bunch about Solana and it kind of being the first like large conference that they held, I was like, I have to go, uh, uncoincidentally, uh, or coincidentally, um, ultimately, uh, breakpoint last year kind of marked the Pico top. And so it was funny just being there and, uh, everybody kind of euphoric and, uh, super excited. And 
Um, I was definitely interested this year to see how the Breakpoint Conference would go just with kind of being in a bear market. Um, and I was surprised because uh, so many engineers, so many builders, the, the hacker houses, even preceding uh, the Breakpoint event, the energy was quite electric. Uh, people were excited to be, be there. Uh, people were showing off different demos. Um, but it was really uh, even kind of a stronger community presence than I felt uh, in the Breakpoint uh, the prior year. Uh, the funny thing is the day after uh, is when FTX ultimately imploded. And I would say that for the people that were still in Portugal, uh, the vibe definitely changed. But you no, know, it, it was exciting to see that ultimately um, people were excited and building on Solana. Absolutely. And I think like um, it was a much more builder focused conference. Like there was yeah. less noise and it, it was really focused on the very core things. And we decided consciously to go bigger at breakpoint um, leading up to it uh, from a perspective that we identified pretty much early on with V3 that like breakpoint will very likely have all of our core user base out there. <laughs> and yes. um, we definitely wanted to cater to them. And so, uh, you know, the talks that we did, uh, um, some other things that we also ended up doing at breakpoint, we really like very much driven by the fact that we understood that it will be a builder's conference and that mm -hmm. those are, you know, users we want to attract first. And, um, that paid off for us, I think in, in many ways. And then, yeah, I mean, the, the fact that it happened the next day with FTX, um, definitely was, a yeah, just shows this, you know, the cyclical nature <laughs> of yeah. things. Pico, so, yeah, was... Pico top from, uh, 2021 to, uh, almost Pico bottom. Uh, at least hopefully, uh, in 2022, <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I, I highly, highly recommend anybody that's involved in the Solana ecosystem or even people that are just curious and wanting to learn more to definitely attend, uh, either the, the Solana hackathons, um, but if they can, the breakpoint event, just because, uh, it is so cool to be able to meet the engineers. And I think you and the squad teams did a f fantastic job of, uh, one, just your, your talks, um, on on stage and then ultimately just your presence. Uh, I was able to meet a lot of people on the squad's team and um, it was, I was personally just super excited to talk to them. So the, your presence was definitely well known there. I appreciate it. Yeah, and um, the, 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 the events that we we did and yeah, I mean, it was also very exciting for us just to meet everybody and yeah, I mean, it was a fantastic event for sure. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely been it's been fun to just watch the progress. Um, I would say going forward for like this next year and kind of uh, with some of the noise removed from the the bull market, now just kind of reiterating the focus again on actually building um, and creating products and users love. What are some things that we, you would like to see happen in squads? Uh, kind of for like this coming year or something that you'd like to see happen in like the Sonic ecosystem more broadly? Um, I think with squads, um, I, I want to validate my thesis that I mentioned earlier around getting, you know, to, to a point with a certain version, cutting it off, formally verifying it, making it a non-upgradable and moving on to the next one and seeing mm -hmm. how like how that works from a perspective of attracting more users and um, how that also helps us to develop um, a code base that's supposed to be complex, but yet needs to be very secure. Um, and I'm curious to see how that approach kind of goes forward. Um, I feel like what I definitely want to see is to create a baseline, like with V3 specifically, that like, this is a very simple standard that you can build on top of, you can rely on to, to hold your assets on chain. And I definitely want to see more assets flowing into um, Solana and just being held on Solana. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think like having a reliable infrastructure to do that definitely will help kind of the, the general, uh, public to be more comfortable in, in holding assets on Solana. And I think also that, uh, pairs really well with, um, work that Solana itself has been doing in terms of like working on performance and resolving technical debt that was created during the bull run. So I think all of that combined is, um, is, is very interesting for me, sort of seeing where, where that goes. Um, as probably everybody mentions, like I'm super excited about Fire Dancer, uh, for sure. Um, 
also very excited about Solana Mobile. Like when I first heard about mm -hmm. um, Saga, I was I wasn't I wasn't certain how I feel. And um, as I was learning more about it, and like I got to play with it at Breakpoint and talk to the guys that are building it, who are amazing. Um, I, I became really I'm really bullish now, and uh, we're building our own mobile app for Saga as we speak and trying to get it out as soon as possible and make sure that like it's it's there from from day one. Um, so super interested in in seeing how that transforms things as well, but also from like a self custody perspective because to me. Yep. That's also like a great value prop. Like you have a, it, it's, it's a ledger, but it's also a phone basically with a secure element in. Um, so I think like that's also super interesting to see. And I'm very excited to about it as well. Yeah, no, uh, Fire Dancer, uh, the Kevin uh, talk from Jump uh, was fascinating. And uh, hopefully something's in the works relatively soon to get Kevin on the podcast and we can do a deep dive of uh, Fire Dancer. Uh, and all the cool things that the jump team is working on to uh, make Solana perform it, as well as the SMS guys. Uh, I met uh, that team ultimately and uh, was able to attend some of their events. And yeah, I had kind of the same reaction as you be like, why are they making a phone? And then after a while, like I was like, okay, like it's starting to make more sense. You do have the ledger element um, to secure your assets ultimately. Uh, on the phone in a secure enclave and i was like okay i'm, I'm gonna pre-order it now and again like going t back to uh being able to really kind of i think one of the main premises is of um crypto is like ownership and being able to own that data and that includes the private key management so anything whether it's uh, what the SMS team is working on whether uh, multi-signature that you and the squads team are building Anything that can make that experience more simplistic, I think, is dramatically needed for the ecosystem to uh, get more users. So there's a lot of awesome things kind of like with the scaling, with like being able to make private key management easier that's happening in the Solana ecosystem. Um, and then now, ultimately, as you said, kind of getting some more assets on the chain, making the chain more reliable, all those things have slowly been battle tested, I would say um for the past year and so excited for those two um ultimately i would say just more confidence um in the ecosystem so um it's definitely going to be an exciting next year um but i think um really you and the squad team and a lot of the builders that i've talked to are very well positioned to uh continue to grow with the solana ecosystem as well yeah, I appreciate it. And I think like the, um, I've been thinking a lot about like blockchain performance and reliability of layer ones mm -hmm. lately and like throughout this year. And I think like if I was to to choose a chain where I would build, I would probably wouldn't go with a chain that like is very new and didn't have any problems yet. Didn't have that experience. I particularly have to like building some blockchain infrastructure myself and understanding you know, what potentially the process might entail and how complex that is. Um, they're like, you, you'd want, you know, for, for the blockchain to make as many mistakes as possible, as quickly as possible to get through, mm -hmm. right. To actually make it a reliable piece of infrastructure. And I think like, um, the, the more kind of issues we had and then seeing them being resolved and seeing all the work that's being done right now to get them resolved. And like, so we never go back to them is actually the, is more bullish than just kind of like, um, you know, expecting those things to never happen. So I think I'm, I'm very excited for, for what's coming. Yeah. I mean, the amount of throughput that Solana is doing, uh, uh, compared to, uh, the Ethereum virtual machine chains, uh, Solana is doing more throughput than all of them combined, uh, which I always found fascinating. Uh, and so the level that Solana has been tested to, uh, those chains have a long way to go. So yeah, I, I agree. Uh, being able to iterate quickly is super important. Um, awesome. Well, maybe kind of my last and final question. Uh, let me change it slightly. Or let me ask it in two parts for my spicy questions. 
Uh, I guess the first one won't be too spicy, but for anybody uh, more broadly, that's either wanting to build or I would say get involved in uh, the Solana ecosystem or even more like blockchain and crypto more broadly, what would your advice be to like builders? Um, and then what would your advice be to people that are just wanting to learn more about the ecosystem? I think the builders, the advice would be um, join join the hackathon. Um, that helped us enormously. I think the work Solana is doing with these is great. Um, I would visit the hacker houses if you can, because um, meeting people in real life actually is, is a different experience. Um, I'm, I would definitely be active on Twitter. I would try to talk to as many people as possible. I would like, I don't remember what the name of this Cunningham's law, something, right? Mm -hmm. Kyle will talk about this, like being wrong on Twitter, uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of being, being wrong in public is actually great. Cause like you'll yeah. learn much quicker. I think that's a great advice. Um, so I think, yeah, probably all of these things, if you ask like Chase from Solana Foundation, he'll probably mention exactly these three things as, as I'm thinking about it. Um, I think more kind of from our experience, um, the thing I, I, I was thinking a lot about as well, it was a lot of like reflective um, reflection on my side in the last few few weeks for sure. And uh, like when it comes to bringing sort of investors, partners, employees on board, definitely like personal connection and relationships, they matter a lot. Mm -hmm. And like particularly with investors, like I would get advice early on that, you know, think about what value they bring, like think about what they can do for you. And to me, that was always important, but you really need to tr treat your investors as like um, founders on the bench. And yeah. so <laughs> you need to like them. They need to like you and you need to have a connection if you want to, you know, make that relationship meaningful uh, and helpful to you and, and, and exciting for, for both of you. So that's probably like for the builders. Um, and um, I think more broadly, if someone wants to learn about Solana ecosystem, um, yeah, again, I, I, I really like just personal connection. So I would definitely talk to, to people in the ecosystem, talk to builders. Um, I think like, um, I was, I, I'm, I'm always doing these things myself. For instance, like, I'm not really sure how, like what's happening in the gaming part of things on Solana. And so I would just tweet, you know, um, where, where do I start? Like, what, if, if I was to learn about gaming on Solana, like what are the top, you know, 10 projects you would highlight? And that's how I usually go about it. Like I pick, you know, sector that I'm interested in. And then I just ask people that I like about what they like from that specific part of things. And that usually leads me into the rabbit hole of learning a lot more. I do that a lot. Like, um, yeah. And I think like Solana has amazing infrastructure, has great NFT tooling, some awesome NFT projects and, um, and DeFi, like if you actually, I recently did that, by the way, it was just like curious to see what's happening in the DeFi ecosystem like today, like who is the most active and there's actually so much going on. Um, so yeah, just do deep dives. Don't be, um, kind of don't, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions and really, and also, and then like play around with things again, Solana is at today's prices is even less prohibitive than ever for you to come and test all these dApps and do whatever you want here. So definitely yep. that's like a good, a good time to do it. Awesome. No, I t would totally echo all that advice. Um, and then maybe my last question, uh, normally I ask kind of what project do you think are doing things uniquely bad? Uh, but maybe I'll reframe that in a sense of like, what, what projects do you think ultimately, um, need the most support kind of in, um, today's age and then what projects outside of squads do you think are like doing things really well, uh, that, uh, you think are helping like pushing the ecosystem forward? Um, I think like amazing question, but I think in terms of support, um, it's, it's also a really good way to reframe it. Uh, I think in terms of support, um, like we we're kind of lucky with squads. We have been lucky with squads from a perspective that we can both apply to retail and we can apply to like the internal ecosystem participants and apply to builders and potential institutions. And like, we, we, we have a broad appeal. I think there's definitely some interesting work being done on like retail facing, um, projects. And, mm -hmm. um, there isn't as much retail as there used to be. And so I think like definitely 
helping these projects to kind of stay afloat and uh, test their hypotheses and just kind of like test what they trying, you know, what they're trying to build basically and, and understand if it's, it's viable in the current market environment um, is definitely an important thing because a lot of them are great and they just need like, you know, to be able to survive until um, kind of e ecosystem becomes a bit more active. Um, I think like on the, um, which projects I think are doing exceptional things. Um, there's so many, um, like always first comes to mind is probably Helios, Helios Labs and what they're doing on the infrastructure side. And I'm a huge fan of Mert and like, yeah, I think he's, he's really becoming this like very significant, uh, participant in the ecosystem in his own right, as well as Helios becoming very important for us. So definitely super excited about Helios. Um, I think Solana fam is like, they're, they're, they're really good. Like the way they approach this very complicated product that for a while I thought is very simple and can kind of, there are only so many ways you can do a block explorer yeah. um, and they always find amazing ways to make it, um, to make it, you know, exciting. And then I think dialect and they, you know, the breakpoint they announced their uh, smart messaging, um, stack. And yeah, I think those guys are incredible. Like the, um, what, what they're trying to do. And, uh, like the, the, the thing they already did with notifications was great and it's still like super useful, but how they're trying to approach like their new products now is super interesting to me. And the dialect app is, uh, is very exciting. So probably those are top three, but to be honest, there's so many that I can mention. I also probably should give a shout out to, uh, Tensor. Definitely a big fan of what these guys are doing with this kind of like, um, pro NFT trading platform. Um, mm -hmm. definitely I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see like more interesting takes on NFT infrastructure on Solana and like Cardinal and Tensor are definitely there in the, in the front lines. For me. Oh, awesome. Well, uh, no, I appreciate, uh, kind of your thoughts and yeah, no, it's a lot of awesome teams building on Solana. Uh, and so excited for what is to come, uh, appreciate your time appreciate what you and your team are building at squads um as i said it, private key management and kind of that entire process is probably one of the more difficult challenges and so i'm exciting uh, appreciative that your team is kind of making that easier for everybody so again thank you so much for your time stefan uh really appreciate uh you coming on the podcast uh sharing your thoughts about uh, the ecosystem, uh, sharing details about the many different products, uh, the formal verification on the safety side that you're doing, uh, the partnerships that you guys announced, you're doing a lot, but, uh, appreciate your time and appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been, it's been great. Awesome. Thanks.